I'm going to get started with the introduction. So, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Katie Barnhart, and thank you for tuning in to the USGS Landslide Hazards Seminar. This meeting is hosted by the Landslide Hazards Program and co-organized by Matt Thomas, Stephen Slaughter, and Jamie Kostelnik. For those of you who are new to this meeting, you have the ability to submit questions via the chat or to use your the raise your hand feature in combination with your microphone and or video camera. We'll wait until the end of the presentation to take questions. And in the meantime, please do um, make sure to that your microphone is muted when you aren't intending to speak. So today I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, Jeremy Vendetti, who is a professor of environmental sciences at Simon Fraser University. He's also the founding director of the School of Environmental Sciences and associate member of the Earth Sciences Department. He holds degrees from the University of Guelph, the University of Southern California, and the University of British Columbia. And his current research focuses on understanding the dynamics of bedrock canyons. And I look forward to hearing his talk today about a landslide that impacted the Fraser River in British Columbia. Thank you for joining us, Jeremy. Uh, thanks, Katie. Um, so, uh, well, thanks for the introduction. And uh, before I get too far into this, I wanted to note that I'm uh, sort of the frontline representative of a much bigger group of scientists that has been working on this, uh, on the Big Bar landslide. Um, and they include a group of uh, PIs who initially uh, pulled some money together to start working on this. And then a whole group of um, postdocs, uh, graduate students and technicians are uh, largely working through Simon Fraser University. So um, I tried to note uh, what they did as we went along. And um, if I uh, if I fail to uh, be rest assured that someone else probably did the work that you're gonna see in a moment here. Um, so uh, on June 23rd, uh, 2019, a rock slide was reported in the Fraser ne River near uh, Big Bar, British Columbia, Canada, that blocked the river to salmon migration. And so for those of you who don't know a lot about salmon, salmon are born and reared uh, in rivers. They then go out to the ocean for two to three years, uh, and they come back uh, to their ancestral spawning grounds, all sort of uh, meaty and juicy, and people really like to eat them at that point. Um, so they're on this kind of four to five year uh, life cycle. And so if you have a rock slide and it blocks the river for four to five years, well, that's it, right? Um, that population of salmon are essentially extinct. So um, I like to note that in the Fraser River, the journey that salmon go through is truly epic. Uh, it includes travel through a gauntlet of uh, fishermen in the ocean and then an indigenous fishery in the um, uh, in the river, and then they have to go up a 375 kilometer bedrock canyon with very turbulent, violent flows. So, you know, it's, it's a tough place for salmon um, to uh, get upstream. Uh, and also for, for, I'm sure people here know this, but, you know, salmon are really iconic animals on the west coast of North America. They're an important uh, commercial fishery. Uh, they're really central to indigenous culture. So when, um, you know, fish can't get up past the rock slide in the Fraser River, it's a really big deal. You know, it's uh, on the front page of the newspapers and it's, um, you know, it's sort of the lead story uh, in the media for sometimes weeks. And, and in fact, it was almost like that for an entire summer. So once this uh, rock slide happened in the Fraser River, there was um, a recognition uh, that something had to be done immediately. Uh, it then became obvious that there was a risk of uh, meaningful extinction. Uh, so if that rock slide had sat there with no work done on it for four to five years, that would be it. There'd be no more salmon in the upper basin of the Fraser uh, River. Um, it was then recognized uh, very quickly that uh, the mortality rate uh, after the landslide when it first occurred uh, for salmon was on the order of about 100%. There was almost no fish that uh, got through. That uh, prompted the federal government of Canada to issue uh, contact, a contract that was initially $52 million uh, to try to clear the landslide. And it became uh, uh, obvious very quickly that 
uh, clearing the landslide was not going to be something that um, was easy to do. Uh, you know, the flows here were going, uh, you know, over 10 meters per second. There are no roads. Uh, and um, getting into a bedrock canyon to clear rock was, was an almost impossible task. So then there was a decision made to build a fishway at the site. And there was another $176 million um, contract issued to build a slow moving channel along the side of the Fraser River to let the salmon get up and pass. So if you're doing the math there, you know, this is almost a quarter billion of uh, dollars that were spent uh, trying to help the salmon get past this, uh, the big bar landslide. Um, so what I wanna do today is I would like to, uh, first of all, start talking about what happened at uh, Big Bar. I wanna talk about the physical impacts on the river and on uh, salmon. I then wanna uh, try to uh, uh, capture it within a concept that we have been using here around the impacts related to this uh, landslide that we've been referring to as ecohazards. And so very briefly, uh, ecohazards, to be honest, is, is, a, is a name I made up, and I hope it's not applied to something else, but, uh, but it's something we made up basically to characterize a geophysical event uh, that poses a hazard, not necessarily to people or to um, infrastructure, uh, but instead to the biosphere, right? Uh, and in this case, to salmon populations. And interestingly, these ecohazards that we've been thinking of, they have, um, they have cascading uh, effects, uh, just like a natural hazard um, cascade. Uh, I'd then like to shift a little bit and talk about hydraulic barriers to salmon migration, you know, barriers that are uh, like the one that formed due to the big bar landslide. And I'll try to wrap things up by talking about the frequency and magnitude of landslides uh, that are capable of uh, blocking the Fraser River. So I'll start out with just a little bit of context. Um, you know, the Fraser River is in southwestern uh, British Columbia, Canada. The Fraser runs uh, from the Rocky Mountains across the interior plateau of British Columbia and then through a 375 kilometer long bedrock canyon before it turns west near Vancouver and then uh, flows into uh, the Pacific Ocean. Um, the reach that is most prone to landslides is uh, the Fraser Canyon, uh, where the river alternates between uh, a very wide valley with uh, glacial fluvial fill to really kind of narrow uh, bedrock uh, gorges um, that I have shown here on the slide. Uh, the, one of the things I like to note here is that uh, the Fraser is huge, right? Um, so comparable mountain rivers with discharges this high really only exist in the, in the Himalaya mountains. Um, although the Columbia River in the US uh, was probably very similar to the um, Fraser River before it was turned into a whole series of lakes. Um, this variation in the morphology is exhibited uh, by simply looking at the width and the depth of the river. You can see the incredible variation that we have in the width of this river. Um, it goes from places where there are these very narrow gorges where we have a width to depth ratio on the order of one. That means it is about as wide it is as it is deep. And then you go to other places where you're in very wide valleys where the width to depth ratio exceeds 100. Uh, but one of the things I like to note when uh, showing people this is that um, even in those very wide uh, reaches of the river, it's important to recognize that this is a bedrock river, right? So if you go down to river level, the banks are mostly bedrock all the way uh, along the channel. And so, and so we do have to think about it as a bedrock river uh, and not uh, an alluvial river that you know, can sort of make its own shape as it uh, flows through sediment. Um, so after we became involved in research on the Big Bar landslide, uh, we decided one of the first things we should do is probably figure out when it happened. And so we went back and we started searching through satellite uh, databases. And as I mentioned, you know, the rock slide was reported uh, to the federal government and to the media on June 23rd, 2019. So we thought, oh, well, we'll go back a few days or a couple of weeks or maybe even a month and find out when this thing happened. And it turns out it happened a lot earlier than anybody had um, had thought. Um, so it happened, uh, it turns out, between October 31st and November 2nd, uh, 2018. 
Um, so uh, we have more or less determined that it happened on November 1st, uh, 2018. The reason why we do that is when we look at the satellite imagery, what we see is that you know, there was a rapid that was upstream of the landslide, which is shown by the star here on um, the satellite images. Uh, there was a rapid upstream of uh, where the landslide happened. And then if you go to November 2nd and November 4th, where we have uh, some more imagery, we can see that upstream of where the landslide happened, there was a backwater zone. That rapid is basically drowned out. And there's a new rapid that formed right at the base of the, um, of the landslide there. And so I, I think one of the things it's important to remember when we think about this landslide is the area where it happened is so remote that um, that rock slide went unreported for uh, about eight months uh, before some of the locals realized that salmon couldn't get past the landslide. And that's when it became sort of a, um, a national emergency. So in terms of what happened uh, at the landslide uh, site, so approximately 90,000 cubic meters of uh, rock fell into the river. Uh, you can imagine by uh, most standards, that is an absolutely tiny um, uh, mass movement. Uh, and really the problem here is that is the rock slide came down uh, off of the hill slope and um, it came off of a cliff really, and then it fell into a very narrowly constricted part of the river. And that's what caused the problem. It caused the seven meter high uh, overfall, which is very much like a waterfall that dammed the river uh, for about uh, seven hours. And then the water got through, but ultimately it formed what we call a hydraulic barrier to salmon migration because the water was going so fast uh, that there was just no way that the salmon could get up past it. Uh, so, you know, how did this affect the channel morphology at, uh, at the Big Bar landslide? Well, um, before the landslide, uh, the channel had what we call a constriction pool widening morphology that is really typical of uh, bedrock um, rivers. Um, so these constriction pool widening morphologies are, are basically exactly what the name implies. Uh, they are repeating forms that occur in bedrock uh, rivers. What I have shown here on this slide is uh, multi-beam echo soundings of constriction pool widenings uh, in Black Canyon, which is also in the Fraser River. Uh, and you can see that we have uh, sort of narrowly constricted uh, um, uh, uh, cross sections of the river. And then we have uh, pools that form more or less uh, downstream of the constriction. And then the ch channel gets wider as we go downstream from there. They often have this uh, trumpet shape, but they're really irregular. You can see that there's, there's these five constriction pool widenings in uh, Black Canyon, and they're really irregular. And, and it's mainly because they're eroding rock, and the rock itself is very irregular. Um, and you also notice by looking at these um, constriction pool widenings, that the pools can occur downstream, uh, within, or upstream of the constriction. And the main reason for that is, you know, these um, uh, these pools can move, right? They, they, they can erode and migrate up, pass through uh, the constriction uh, that ultimately form them. So we have uh, argued in a whole series of papers that um, this constriction pool widening morphology uh, forms due to plunging flows, uh, which are velocity inversions that occur in um, bedrock canyons. What I have shown on the slide here is uh, the easting northing vector of velocity in Black Canyon. Um, and what you can see is that if you look at the hot colors uh, on that easting northing vector, that's basically the velocity magnitude. And if you look at the hot colors, you can see that the hot colors go down uh, below the uh, water surface. And what's happening there is there's a velocity inversion that has occurred. Um, and then along the sidewalls of the channel, we have vertical flow that's going up those uh, sidewalls. And what that does, it produces a flow condition that is conducive to widening of the channel. It drives sediment and water into the banks of the river. And so within the pool, due to this plunging flow, you're driving sediment and water into the walls, and that ultimately is capable of forming um, a wider channel downstream of the constriction and downstream of the pool. 
uh, and hence the constriction pool widening uh, morphology. Uh, so if we go back and we look at the big bar uh, landslide site, it clearly had this constriction pool widening uh, morphology before the landslide. And in fact, there's two constrictions. There's one where the landslide happened. And if you look on the uh, left hand side here, you can see there's another constriction immediately downstream of that uh, constriction pool widening downstream of where the landslide happened. So after the landslide, the channel morphology changed. We don't really change the width of the channel here but um, we do put a lot of debris into the channel and that forms uh, an overfall step. And so that step forms a flow condition that's very similar to a waterfall, except the flow uh, does not uh, detach. So this changed the distribution of velocities in the channel. Um, so before the slide, we have high velocities going into the constriction, but then the flow really slows down. Um, uh, as it comes out of that constriction is because the high velocity water is moving on the bed of the river and there's low velocity uh, on the surface. And that's a good condition for a fish to get through. Uh, the change in morphology shifted the distribution of velocities at the landslide. And so what happens, and you can see this on the right hand side, is that it creates it created a high velocity uh, zone with concentrated flow in the middle of the channel. Uh, and this kind of tongue of very highly aerated and turbulent flow that just can't be easily navigated uh, by salmon. Um, so this is uh, the surface velocity at the Big Bar landslide in 2020, the landslide shown by the star uh, on these uh, maps. Um, and so, so the surface velocity, we capture this uh, with drones. And we did this right after the landslide at a whole series of uh, discharges. Um, and so it's important for me to note when I show you this, that salmon can swim anaerobically at speeds of, uh, of about five to eight meters per second, depending on their size. So if the velocity goes above five to eight meters per second, you're really putting a lot of stress on the fish to try to get through a zone. And so if you look at um, the discharge uh, dependent uh, velocity in the channel, you can see that at about 3,000 cubic meters per second, the high velocity zone extends all the way across the channel and uh, downstream, and hence the uh, hydraulic barrier to fish migration. But if you go down below about 2,000 cubic meters per second, um, the velocities are lower and they're outside of that anaerobic uh, swim threshold. So, uh, uh, at at um, discharges less than about 2,000 cubic meters per second, the landslide is passable, uh, or it was uh, passable. Um, but of course, that's not when the fish want to uh, try to migrate um, upstream. Uh, so th that was where the mortality came in. So it turns out that this, um, this blockage was uh, ultimately discharge dependent. So this shows the discharge at Big Bar in 2009 with the black line. Um, and when different types of salmon tried to pass uh, the landslide, shown in sort of the colors uh, down below uh, with the names on them, those are different types of salmon trying to get upstream. And so then um, below that, along sort of the bottom of the plot, you can see that there are these square points. And those square points are attempts by uh, salmon to pass the landslide and ultimately a failure uh, to do so. And so many of those fish probably died. Um, some of the fish may have uh, made another attempt, though. And so then if you look at the dots that are up above the black line, uh, that's where fish were measured to have passed the blockage. And the height of those dots on the plot here are the maximum passes discharge uh, recorded for uh, the species. And so. Um, uh, it's important to recognize. So then, the 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 dis the blockage here, or the hydraulic barrier, is discharge dependent, and um, it, it ultimately depended on how big the fish were as to whether they were able to get um, upstream and past it. Um, so the acute barrier uh, that happened in 2019 and 2020, right after the landslide, uh, ha made some uh, population year classes above the slide 
basically functionally extinct. And so if you look at the, some of the information we have over on the uh, left-hand side of the slide here, you can see that um, for uh, some uh, salmon runs that like to go in July to early August, um, when we have high discharge, the survival rate of those salmon was less than uh, 1%. If we go in late July to early September, that's when we have a moderate discharge, the survival rate of those salmon uh, begins to increase. And then if we go, uh, you know, when we start having low flows in the Fraser River in August through to September, our survival rate of um, fish goes up to about 80%. And again, this is when the the blockage uh, was acute in the Fraser River. And so I, I, I should probably note that the barrier was partly ameliorated by work that was done to produce a naturally slow zone along the West Bank in about 2021. And the thought is, is that the landslide is now passable by fish. It's not a great place for them, but um, it's at least passable. And so then, you know, the, the 2019 and the 2020 year classes of these runs will likely be re repopulated by stray migrants and, and fish that they decide to go a year early or a year late from their, um, their normal years of, uh, of migration. Um, so I wanna just spend a couple of minutes here uh, talking about um, eco-hazards and what is an eco-hazard and why uh, you should care about it. Uh, so, yeah, so we, we've been talking about this idea about an eco-hazard. So it's, a, it's basically a geological uh, uh, event that impacts uh, the biosphere, uh, but not necessarily people and inf infrastructure. So if we think about natural hazards, they're always defined in sort of the number of people they kill and the, and the dollar value of the infrastructure that they destroy. And it turns out in this case, those are not really relevant metrics of uh, how important this hazard was. And so that's why we've sort of invented this word eco-hazard. Um, and it's important to recognize that eco-hazards can have uh, cascading effect, uh, effects or impacts. So if we have a geophysical event, it has an environmental impact. And in our case, it changed the velocity structure in the Fraser River at the, at the location. Um, and then that had an impact on uh, uh, the biosphere. So, so in our, in our case, that's an impact on uh, fish uh, migration. But then if you go and the fish can't um, get past because of the change environmental impacts, it turns out then you have a whole cascading set of effects. So it has an impact on um, the indigenous uh, fishery uh, in the Fraser River. It has an impact on um, the commercial fishery in the uh, Fraser uh, River and in, in the ocean just off of uh, British Columbia here. And then there's also some sort of, um, oh, sorry. I should have been incrementing my uh, slide there. Uh, sorry about that. Um, but then it also has uh, an impact on uh, the ecology uh, of, the, of the Fraser Basin, right? Because, you know, bears uh, like to eat uh, salmon and and then salmon, you know, once they uh, make their way up onto the banks of the river, they feed the forest. And so there's sort of a broader ecological uh, impact that might happen there. So we have this kind of a geophysical event, and then it has a cascade through the biophysical environment um, that ultimately leads to broader um, impacts. And so that's why we've been uh, uh, referring to them as uh, eco-hazards um, uh, as being sort of a distinct class from, from natural hazards. Uh, the reason why uh, we care about this and why I think you should care about this is that Big Bar landslide is not unique. In fact, it's not unique in any way. Um, this is uh, Hell's Gate, uh, another very narrow constriction in the Fraser River. And like uh, Big Bar, Hell's Gate had a um, constriction pool widening morphology. Uh, in about uh, 1912, 1913, Canadian National Railway decided they were going to put um, a, uh, a rail line uh, through here. And uh, sort of a sloppy uh, contractor uh, put a whole bunch of waste rock into uh, the river. And um, uh, in doing so, they created a hydraulic barrier because they filled the constriction up with, um, with uh, rock. Uh, and then... Uh, this happened. Uh, there was a landslide uh, 
uh, again, just like at Big Bar, it was a small uh, rock slide, about 80,000 cubic meters, but it came down and sat on top of that waste rock from the, um, uh, from the, um, uh, the railway construction. Uh, and what it did is, well, it went and it created a, a five meter high overfall which was reduced to about three meters after a little bit of blasting. So, you know, that should sound like a familiar story to you now that I've told you about the big bar landslide. Basically the same thing happened at Hell's Gate and really only about a hundred years uh, before that. Uh, it had a dramatic impact on salmon populations in the Fraser River. Uh, so you can see, you know, there are really these big abundant uh, salmon runs before the 1914 uh, rock slide. Uh, and then that reverberated and caused this kind of decline in um, salmon uh, uh, run populations that lasted until about the 1990s or so. And the reason why the 1990s um, uh, worked out okay was, was because in the 1940s to the 1960s, there was a huge fishway built at, um, at Hell's Gate, which should also sound like a familiar story to you now I've told you about uh, Big Bar. Um, so the other reason to care about this is, uh, you know, these, these small rock slides, I think are, um, you know, they can be, they can be dealt with through engineering, uh, methods, but there are landslides that happen in the Fraser river that, uh, you know, would be very difficult to, uh, deal with. So, um, you know, the Texas Creek landslide that was, uh, uh documented by Jude Ryder in the 1990s was about 500 times the size of the big bar and Hell's Gate uh, uh, rock slides. Um, it, uh, the uh, rock avalanche that happened there created a dam that was 50 meters high and it had a backwater that extended almost 15 kilometers uh, upstream. So it created uh, a lake and there's definitely no way fish got past that. Probably not for a few years, um, more likely for tens of years and maybe even for hundreds of uh, years where salmon just didn't go past um, Texas Creek and the Fraser River. And so, you know, many archaeologists think that uh, this abandonment, or sorry, uh, that this rock slide caused the abandonment of many of the indigenous villages upstream um, because the indigenous peoples were very heavily dependent on that fish migration for uh, food. So there's a really well uh, documented cascade here, um, cascading eco hazard. Uh, so this kind of uh, led to a project that uh, we have a very big group working on right now, um, uh, where we've been trying to uh, better understand uh, eco hazards, and in particular, uh, we've been trying to understand uh, more about uh, the events that could cause impacts on the biosphere. Uh, and we've been looking at the magnitude and frequency of uh, landslides. We've also been looking at the impacts of these eco hazards, including um, looking at hydraulic barriers and how fish uh, try to na navigate past them. And then we also have a group that um, is looking at the impact of eco hazards like the big bar landslide on uh, genetic variation. And so uh, I'm going to talk about the first two, uh, the uh, magnitude and frequency and the hydraulic barriers. I'm not going to talk about the genetic variation work because we have a very competent team doing that um, at the University of Victoria. And uh, to be honest, I only understand it uh, conceptually, so it's best that I don't talk about it in front of others. <laughs> um, so I'm going to shift the gears here a little bit and start talking about the work we've been doing to try to understand hydraulic barriers to salmon migration, like the one that uh, happened at Big Bar. Um, so this is some work that has been done by uh, a very clever uh, master's student uh, who worked in our group, Morgan Wright. Um, she's now a research tech with us at uh, Simon Fraser University. Um, and so what she did is she started searching the Fraser River for locations of very high uh, velocity. And so uh, what the plot shows here is the velocity variation, the measured velocity variation going down the Fraser River. Um, so the, the, um, the, the mean velocity for the entire canyon is about two and a half times the, or sorry, is 2.5 meters per second. But there are locations where uh, 
the velocity is up to three times uh, that standard deviation. Sorry. There are places where the velocity is three times the standard deviation about the mean. And so we, we sort of start out and said, well, maybe those are hydraulic barriers to um, fish migration. Uh, and so then we can test that hypothesis by comparing um, uh, how fish swim to the velocity in the river. In the river. And so one of the things I like to, uh, or I need to explain is that salmon have different types of swimming. I didn't know this when we started the project, but I've learned this. But so they, they can do something called sustained swimming. And that's when they are swimming um, aerobically. Uh, and they can do that for very long uh, periods of time. Uh, they then have something called prolonged swimming. And so pro prolonged swimming uses both aerobic and anaerobic pathways to fuel the energy uh, to swim. And that results in fatigue that happens after about 20 to 200 minutes, depending on the fish. And then we have something called burst swimming. And so burst swimming is anaerobic. Uh, and it can only really be done for, you know, about 20 seconds or so. So what uh, Morgan Wright did is she went and she filtered that velocity time series that I showed you to find when fish of different sizes uh, would uh, be able to swim for 50 meters or more. And so what the plot shows here is that for large fish, uh, burst swimming is required. Um, but there's only a few places where it really goes above the threshold uh, for burst swimming, where they can't um, they can't uh, keep up uh, or they they can't make it through. Um, for medium-sized fish, uh, it turns out that our locations where the velocity was about three times the standard deviation of the mean are above the burst threshold for um, uh, salmon uh, swim speeds. Uh, and therefore, they are potential hydraulic barriers. So it turns out our velocity greater than three times standard deviation is not a bad um, metric for what might be a potential barrier. And then, um, but if we go and look at small fish, uh, uh, it turns out that maybe our results are not uh, so reasonable because for small fish, the river appears to be completely impassable uh, to um, small salmon. But we know the small salmon have been migrating through the Fraser River for thousands of years. So it's kind of an unreasonable uh, result. And the reason why we're getting an unreasonable re result here is we started doing this analysis using a centerline um, velocity. And you know the truth is, is fish don't use the centerline. Uh, they can swim up the banks uh, of a river. So we had to kind of change tact about how we were looking at these uh, velocity barriers. So what, um, so what we did is we built a typology of bedrock channel morphologies. And when we started doing this, um, we were doing this because we wanted to figure out where the hydraulic barriers were. But once we were finished, I th we realized that uh, there actually is not a very good typology of um, bedrock rivers in general. And so this typology of hydraulic barriers turns out to be a pretty good um, typology of bedrock river morphology in general. And so then we have defined three different types of morphology. Uh, the first is the constriction pool widening, uh, which have plunging flows and velocity inversions, as I've already described to you. But then we also have um, bedrock steps. And uh, those bedrock steps are places where we have large rocks or um, channel spanning uh, bedrock which creates you know, white water, right? It creates a rapid um, downstream of those bedrock steps. And then we have uh, something that we've been referring to as overfall steps. And this is uh, the sort of morphology that, uh, um, that occurred at Big Bar, where we don't just have rocks creating a rapid, we have rocks that are creating a massive hydraulic um, that's a little like a waterfall and almost impossible for a salmon to uh, get up uh, past. And so then what we did is we took this typology of, uh, of bedrock river morphology and um, we started examining the surface velocity because it turns out the surface velocity is relatively easy. Well, it's not easy, but it's a tractable task uh, that can, uh, so that we can get velocity information on these uh, sites because it's very difficult to get down on the river when you know, the river is going seven or eight meters per second in these locations. So this is a surface velocity uh, map or a series of surface velocity maps measured by a drone 
over a constriction pool widening, um, over a bedrock step at uh, uh, Yale Rapids, and then over an overfall step uh, at the Big Bar uh, landslide. And so you look at this, what you can see is that um, the center line velocity could be a very misleading metric to try to characterize a hydraulic barrier. Uh, and the reason why is because there's there's sort of a really fast moving zone of high velocity water going down to the center of uh, all these sites. But at Yale Rapids and at uh, Black Canyon, where we have our constriction pool widening, the fish can use the banks to get upstream. Um, but if we look at uh, Big Bar, the very high velocities extend all the way across the channel um, over that overfall step. And that's why it becomes a, hyd a hydraulic um, barrier. So if we compare uh, these velocity patterns to swim thresholds, uh, we more or less support that conclusion. So this is uh, swim speed capabilities at various discharges through a constriction pool widening uh, for different, uh, or sorry, for a, what we consider to be a, a medium-sized uh, salmon. And so one of the things you can see here is that as the discharge goes up uh, in the river, the parts of the channel requiring anaerobic swimming for greater than 50 meters uh, increases. Um, and so then it gets progressively more difficult for all the fish to get up past um, uh, constriction pool widening. And we know that there is, in fact, a threshold discharge where fish cannot get past um, a constriction pool widening like Black Canyon because we actually observed um, them not getting past um, uh, Black Canyon last year. And, you know, it happened um, up around sort of the just below the peak uh, mean annual flow. So we have a, a, a great uh, postdoc who's working on this, Evan Burns, and he's working to confirm uh, this hypothesis that um, it is an expansion of the uh, burst swimming uh, area that uh, uh, that is causing this, uh, the reason that is causing fish not to be able to get past this site. Um, if we go and look at a rapid, uh, it turns out burst swimming is required in most places in the channel but there remains a clear path for fish to get upstream, uh, even at relatively high discharges. Now, when you go up to very high discharges around the mean annual flow, it turns out that fish cannot uh, get past uh, Yale Rapids, and that is because of this expansion of the area that requires burst swimming for uh, fish to get through. And again, we're testing that uh, hypothesis with uh, Evan Burns, who's a postdoc with us right now. Um, so if we go to an overfall, uh, that burst swimming is required across the whole channel, and even at moderate uh, discharges, hence the reason why it becomes that uh, hydraulic barrier. So you know, knowing that fish can migrate through these barriers tells us where the barrier barriers may exist, and because we can go through and we can count um, where these different morphologies exist, if we understand how these um, how, how the flow dynamics change at these different sites, we can then start predicting where um, we're going to have hydraulic barriers to fish migration. And we can also consider them in emergency plans. So, you know, if there's another landslide, um, we can start thinking about uh, relatively quickly, we can start thinking about, well, what kind of measurements do we need in order to determine whether there's going to be a problem for salmon or not? And that work is um, being led by, uh, um, by Evan Burns uh, in our group. Um, and the next step in our work is to start testing our physical predictions of where a, a hydraulic barrier is going to occur with biological data collected by um, a team of people who are doing radio tagging of fish and looking at migration behavior past some of these sites uh, that I just showed you where we uh, more or less know what the velocity structure looked like. Uh, so now what I want to do is I want to shift gears a little bit and I want to tell you about some work we've been doing on the frequency and magnitude of uh, landslides that are capable of blocking the Fraser River. This work here is being led by Aaron uh, Steelquist, who's a, a postdoc in, a, in the group, um, who is uh, moving to Stanford uh, in just a couple of uh, weeks or a month or so. Um, so what uh, Aaron has been doing is he's been building uh, an inventory of landslide events in the Fraser River corridor. He's followed uh, uh, the slip method that's used by the Washington State Geological Survey. And what he's found is that 
you know, there's about 279 um, events, uh, landslide events since the glaciation uh, that he can identify. And so what he uh, sees is that um, that the landslide features he's able to identify, and oh, and I should probably mention here as well that uh, we have greatly benefited by an enormous LIDAR data set that has been collected in support of our project by the Hakai Institute. Um, and so we've been, we have tons of, uh, of LIDAR. Uh, basically, the whole Fraser Corridor has been flown, uh, the whole 375 kilometers of the canyon um, has been flown in order to try to identify these uh, landslide features. Um, and so what uh, Aaron has found is that there is, um, that landslide features are more common in northern basin, part of the Fraser Basin, where there are more volcanic rocks and uh, quaternary sediments. Further uh, south, uh, the features uh, are less common. And uh, the reason why is because there's a bit of a change in the, um, in the rock structure. You get a lot more harder granodiorite in the lower part of the river. So you get a different style of, um, of uh, of landslide that happens there, and, the, and and it's just not as easy for us to identify where those uh, landslides have happened, unless they're huge, right? The small ones, we can't really uh, see them very well. And so there's a bit of a preservation bias that happens there. Um, so there's, there's four broad classifications of uh, the features that uh, Aaron has in the um, inventory. They include uh, you know, flows and spreads, uh, slides and slumps, falls, topples and avalanches, uh, and then and then sort of shallow scars in uh, unconsolidated um, sediments. And we've done a bit of quantitative analysis uh, of the uh, landslide inventory, and basically we find that the distribution of landslides is more or less consistent with previous works. Uh, you know, the work by Stark and Hovius, uh, 2001, that laid out uh, what the distribution of areas might look like in a landslide inventory. Um, and, uh, you know, the distribution of, um, or the, the relation between area and volume is more or less also consistent with previous work, you know, work by Isaac Larson. Um, and we find that there's an overall scaling exponent between area and volume of about 1.4. Um, and uh, it turns out that that uh, that is approximately consistent across the different types of uh, failures we see. Um, although there is some slight variation in the scaling exponent by uh, lithology uh, in the database. Um, so we've also been trying to work on the frequency distribution of landslides, you know, because people ask us all the time, they wanna know, well, when is the next big bar landslide gonna happen? And we'd like to provide them with some answer on that. I'm not sure we're gonna quite get there, but we're trying to. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's many landslides that have been documented uh, that have happened in the Fraser River corridor. Uh, they include mostly very large slides. I'm sure many of you have heard of the Hope Slide which is uh, just off of the Fraser River. Um, and they include earth flows, you know, that were well documented by Mike Bovis back in the 1990s. Um, and then there's a number of events from the modern period, right? So we had an atmospheric river go through the Fraser Canyon corridor in 2001. And um, so we have the Jackass Mountain slide, for example, that uh, resulted from that uh, atmospheric river. Um, and so we have this kind of database where we know, you know, roughly uh, when some of the big events have happened, uh, and we know the modern period very well. So what um, Aaron has been doing is he's been trying to build out that data set a little bit um, by looking at the timing of uh, landslides using beryllium cosmo dates uh, of slide material. He's also been looking a little bit at some of the terraces with uh, Aaron Seagren, who is another postdoc working with us. Um, and they've been also looking at the incision rate, um, uh, trying to look at the detrital uh, erosion rates uh, to try to estimate the contribution of landslides to the overall erosion rate um, of the Fraser. So, so far, Aaron has dated uh, four bedrock uh, landslides, including three avalanches and one, uh, one slide. And uh, his results seem to indicate that the slides are post-glacial events, 
Um, they happen, you know, in the last 5,000 years or so. So they're not glacial debutter, debuttressing events. Um, and uh, one of the things I was happy to see is they're not really clustered, um, meaning they're, they're sort of all through um, uh, time. And uh, we also have some preliminary dates on that Texas Creek uh, landslide, you know, the one I talked about uh, being a salmon killer. Um, uh, that are more or less consistent with what June Ryder found back in the 1990s, uh, although we have a quantitative estimate as opposed to an inferred estimate of the date that uh, is what June Ryder was working with. Um, so we have begun uh, thinking about these slides, both from a kind of a classical hazards perspective, but also from this eco-hazard perspective. And we try to think about, well, how do these slides um, ultimately affect the biosphere and, and thinking about the cascading effects they might have on the biosphere. And when we do that, we come up with a somewhat different, um, not really classification, but categorization of different types of slides. Um, and so we have the huge landslides, the ones like the, uh, like the Texas Creek landslide, um, you know, which would have made a lake uh, and, and would have killed all the fish in the Fraser River for many generations. We also have uh, uh, barriers uh, that can form like the one that formed at Big Bar and they may be acute barriers, but ultimately those barriers are probably um, possible to deal with if we're willing to spend many thousands or many millions of dollars to, to get them. And then there's kind of a class of smaller um, uh, events that might happen that uh, are, I refer to them as being rapid makers, right? So they'll create a hydraulic feature, but turns out that hydraulic feature might not be big enough to impact uh, fish. And that the events that occurred during the um, atmospheric river in 2021 that I talked about are, are in that class. And then um, we have other, uh, you know, perhaps sometimes big, large landslides that happen, but they're, uh, but they're uh, earth flows. And so they happen very slowly and they really have no impact on river dynamics aside from providing some sediment to the river. So this is very much a work in uh, progress, but um, it makes sense to us to begin assessing the risk associated with these in, this, in the context of this eco-hazard idea uh, and looking at the impacts that might happen on the biosphere. Uh, and that has led us, uh, oops. Yeah. <laughs> Um, that has led us to start thinking about um, these uh, eco hazards uh, and, and has led us to try to identify places that we think might be sites of concern in the Fraser River corridor um, because they might have a big biosphere impact if a landslide occurred. And some of these sites are familiar to you now. I mean, I've mentioned a number of them. You know, we're, we're still concerned about, uh, you know, Big Bar. There's certainly a chance for further activity there. Um, we're worried about Hell's Gate and Texas Creek because there's, there are other events that are possible there. But then there's a bunch of other places uh, where we have steep bedrock banks that are actively being undercut. And they include places like Black Canyon in the Fraser River, um, Dry Rack Canyon and Fountain Canyon. Uh, where we've been able to go through and I and find um, undercuts uh, of the banks of the river that in some cases are up to five uh, meters deep. And that's some work that Jeff Larimer, another postdoc in our group is, um, is working on right now, trying to identify those, um, those undercutting sites of concern. Um, and then we have uh, a somewhat different class of uh, sites of concern. So at White Canyon, for example, there's a 300 meter high uh, bluff on the river right, a very deep, deeply fractured rock that if it failed, it would block the Fraser Canyon. And there is almost no way that that could be dealt with without uh, you know, taking a fighter jet in and trying to uh, blow up the river. Um, and so you know, that could also happen at a number of other sites, and importantly at Dry Rack Canyon, and where the big bar uh, landslide uh, happened. And so what we've been trying to do uh, is get in there and build integrated uh, data sets that use multi-beam echo sounding, drone surveys, uh, and LIDAR that will allow for a proper geotechnical uh, assessment of the sites. And if there is something that happens there, at least we'll know what the site looked like beforehand. 
Um, and so this is Iron Canyon here, where uh, we've done some uh, drone structure from motion, uh, multi-beam echo sounding, and LIDAR uh, data acquisition. And it's all been overlapped with this uh, sort of magic that uh, Julia Carr, another postdoc in our group, uh, has worked um, to make them look uh, uh, like a picture. So you're looking at a point cloud right here, but it is, in fact, a whole bunch of data sets that Julia Carr has overlaid upon one another. And so what we're hoping to do is um, to get to the point where we can start playing some games with uh, with the information that's coming out of all these studies, where we, uh, we would go to one of these sites of concern and we can figure out for a particular impact um, uh, of different magnitudes or a, a different uh, uh, magnitudes of failures in different places, uh, what is the impact going to be on salmon populations, right? And so we can do that uh, spatially, and, and that's sort of the place we're trying to get with this work. So just a quick review to uh, finish off here. Uh, the Big Bar landslide is a great example of a geophysical event uh, that has cascading impacts uh, on the biosphere, which um, you know I've, uh, we're calling eco-hazards. Um, the Big Bar landslide altered the channel morphology and the flow structure uh, uh, where it happened, creating an impossible or impassable hydraulic barrier uh, to salmon, at least when it first occurred. And then, but it turns out that it is a discharge dependent hydraulic barrier and that there are other discharge dependent hydraulic barriers that exist elsewhere in the uh, Fraser Canyon. And I just want to end by saying, you know, this kind of eco hazards concept uh, provides a, a bit of a new perspective to examine geophysical hazards. Um, that don't necessarily have direct impacts on uh, infrastructure or human mortality, but um, do have very big impacts on the biophysical environment. And uh, with that, I will leave you with a nice slide of the Fraser Canyon and a very long list of all the people who actually did the work I uh, talked about today. Thank you.